let's go through some, uh, some more of this evidence. I've been sharing with you already uh, some, of the, some of the things about evolution and creation, but I want to I go back to the very basic of whether God even exists or not. That's an important point. I mean, if we're going to argue about evolution, for example, I mean, we can show you that evolution happens. We can, we can show you that you know, where, where even creationists have to admit that there's a thing there, that there's, there, there's a reality, and then they'll argue about how far it goes. But with religion, we just have religions continuously splintering into ever more varied subsets due to all these disagreements on, you know, of, of who God is or how many gods there are and all the many diff you know, different conflicting stories behind all of them. Yet every faith combined can't even show that there's a there there, that there is any truth to their assertions or that, or that there is even a supernatural at all. In the mindset of the faithful, they believe that they can believe whatever they want to believe as long as it hasn't been absolutely and conclusively proven false. Although, as young earth creationists and flat earthers and such constantly demonstrate, they will still believe whatever they want to believe, even if it has been proven false conclusively. But in science, you don't have to prove it false. You can, and that sometimes happens, but you don't have to go that far. It's enough to know that there was never sufficient reason to believe it in the first place. If there is no actual fact that can be you know, objectively shown to be really true and that is either positively in indicates this conclusion or exclusively concordant with that contradicting or otherwise eliminating the nearest competitor concept, then without such a fact, science can only dismiss your claim as unsupported, which in science is effectively the same thing as being disproved. It means there's literally nothing to consider, and thus we have no reason to believe you. That's where all religions are, in the category of unsupported assertions. You know, there are so many evidences that make it impossible for the no-God scenario to be true. The first, the word evidence is already plural. You don't have to pluralize it by saying evidences. We're talking about facts in evidence, or we would be if you had any facts and evidence, but you don't. The second, shifting the burden of proof is logically fallacious. Quit trying to disprove a negative, the no-God scenario. Instead, the burden of proof is on the one making the positive claim. That means you have to support your assertion of there being a God. It's not whether the no-God scenario is impossible. It's whether your God is possible. And third, the problem you have with that is twofold. To begin with, in order to say whether something is possible, there must be a precedent or parallel or verified phenomenon indicating that such possibility exists. You don't have that for gods or magic. And then the other problem is not only is your God not even a possibility to consider, but your God is literally impossible. A God is defined by his miraculous nature. And while miracles have essentially the same definition as magic, being the evocation of supernatural forces or entities to control or forecast natural phenomena in ways that are inexplicable by science because they defy the laws of physics. Thus, miracles are physically impossible by definition, and God is therefore impossible by extension. I mean, the simplest protein molecule, the simplest protein molecule has 400 linked amino acids in a very specific order and sequence. It's impossible mathematically for that to even form on its own. The simplest protein molecule is glycine. It consists of two carbons, five hydrogens, one nitrogen, and two oxygens. Not really all that amazing, actually. And for comparison, here are the chemical formulae for the most common compounds found in a piece of granite rock. Just to give you an idea, the mathematical probability of the simplest protein molecule forming on its own is a higher number than the estimated number of atoms in the known galaxy, according to NASA. I'm sorry, not the gal, did I say galaxy? Known universe. Of the trillions of estimated galaxies that exist in the universe, NASA has calculated what they believe the estimated number of atoms in the entire known universe are. And they estimate that to be somewhere in the neighborhood of two times 10 to the 58th power. The mathematical probability of the simplest protein molecule forming is two times 10 to the 58th power. 
more, a higher probability than the number of atoms in the entire known universe. Actually, you just recited the same number twice and you still got it wrong. It's not two times 10 to whatever power, it's just 10 to that power. And the estimate for the number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 78th power up to 10 to the 82nd power, which are both significantly higher than your number. Your number doesn't matter because it's arbitrarily contrived nonsense. The argument from improbability fallacy depends on ignoring natural processes that will ultimately derive a particular product or conclusion, you know, guiding or controlling the outcome. Uh, instead, believers want to pretend that everything just fell together somehow accidentally. Creationists employ this fallacy along with a whole lot of other fallacies because they're trying to deny the very existence of natural processes and their cumulative effects. And that's just the simplest protein molecule forming. According to this study, a 75-atom macrocycle with an salt water solution forms a peptide nucleobase with a hydrophobic core and a hydrophilic surface, just like a protein, which also folds according to non-covalent interactions of the different elements involved. And some of them are interchangeable. It's just straight-up chemistry. But creationists want to forget about natural processes and imagine that we're just saying that, that everything just comes together by chance as opposed to chemical and physical properties, which completely nullify their argument from improbability. And it, 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 if you get to the simplest single cell bacteria, you know, the simplest single cell bacteria, we used to think, oh, well, that's pretty simple. But now we realize how complex that is. Unicellular organisms are, of course, much simpler than multicellular organisms, which involve a whole other level of orchestration. However complex an individual unicellular microbe is, trillions of them orchestrating in a conglomerate unit is necessarily and invariably far more complex. The simplest single cell bacteria is called the prokaryote. It's so funny listening to somebody try to lecture an audience on a topic where he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, the, 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 the smallest or simplest uh, bacteria is called a prokaryote, but the, but then the largest and most complex bacteria is also called a prokaryote. And the extremophile archaea, all of them, they're prokaryotes too. In a sense, prokaryotes are every form of life that isn't a eukaryote. And it doesn't make much sense to talk about single cell bacteria because they're all single cell. There's no such thing as a multicellular bacteria, nor a multicellular prokaryote either. And according to the evolutionary scientists themselves, they have determined that the prokaryote has millions and millions of functioning parts that are to it. All bacterial cells consist of a plasma membrane, a slime layer capsule, cytoplasm, ribosomes, and a nucleoid. How are you interpreting millions and millions of functional parts? And if there are millions of molecular components, are they not just following their chemical properties? Okay, and as a matter of fact, when you look at the several million molecules that are operating in perfect precision. Which they are not, because mutations still occur, which are how bacteria diversified into the innumerable species that exist today. The mathematical probability of even those million evolving, if you will, through positive mutations is a higher number than the previous number that I told you of 2 times 10 to the 58th power. But you don't know what that number is, nor does anyone else, because again, it's nonsense. The argument from improbability fallacy works like this. List all of the events that happened to you yesterday. The more items that are on your list, the more extremely improbable it will be, especially when you figure in the exact times in sequence. How improbable is it that all these things happened in that precise order at exactly those times? Thus, if you are so inclined, you can make the most mundane of daily occurrences seem statistically impossible. That's what creationists are doing here. It's just mathematically impossible that even the simplest of life could somehow form on its own. The no-God scenario is just not logical. Mathematics doesn't allow for it. Notice that when Dukko talks about the no-God scenario, he's actually referring to a no-magic scenario uh, where inexplicable miracles don't play any part and cannot be used as, instead of scientific explanations. However, not every believer is a creationist. There are people who believe in God but who don't believe in magic, 
and therefore their science has to reject miracles to rely instead on the scientific principle of methodological naturalism. And one way to understand physics is as reality being interpreted and expressed mathematically. This is Jeremy England. He's a professor of physics at MIT, but he's also an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. So he believes in the Bible, just like Bob Duco does, at least the, the Hebrew Bible. Rabbi England obviously doesn't believe in the Christian revision of those stories. And Jewish scientists rarely interpret their scriptures literally, like undereducated American Christians so often do. Well, what makes this particular rabbinical physicist so interesting is how Professor England cites the second law of thermodynamics, and I mean the exact example that Duco uses himself, to argue the opposite point not as an atheist and not as a science denying creationist either. Rabbi England concludes that if the God he believes in created life, then maybe he didn't do it by magical miracles or miraculous magic. He didn't have to chant some incantation in Aramaic to speak everything out of nothing. Maybe instead, if God only figuratively said, let the earth bring forth the living thing, then God must have provided some way in which the earth could do that and Professor England wants to find what that way is. He then famously proposed the idea that life exists specifically because of the law of, of, of increasing entropy, driving matter to, to acquire ever more lifelike physical properties to more efficiently dissipate heat. He has since devised and published a number of mathematical formulae to explain how the origin of life follows from the fundamental laws of nature, where he also notes that the properties of self-replicators must be constrained by thermodynamic laws. I'll put a link to that paper below. And we'll talk more about the evolution or the origin of life later in this series, where we'll get specific on several successive stages of that process. But for right now, on the one hand, we have an uneducated religious apologist who is paid to lie for Jesus, and who we've already seen has been proven wrong on every single argument or claim he's made so far. And now he says that the formation of life is mathematically impossible. And on the other hand, we have a mathematician saying the very opposite, that the formation of life is not only mathematically possible, but under these conditions is actually inevitable. So who are we going to believe? A celebrated genius, a, an academic expert, or a know-nothing grifter who is always wrong about everything, doesn't want to understand anything, and who only wants to make believe what he already knows is not really true. Tough choice, I know. But that's what the choice always is with creationism. The empty assertions of the willfully ignorant professional liar or objectively verifiable scientific fact. I find it amazing and depressing how many people can surely see what the truth obviously is, yet still prefer to pretend something else instead.